welcome, Cece. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to our Sunday service. If you are able to rise, please join us in our hymn of Down to the River. I want 
You're all I've ever needed. You're all I want. Help me know you are near. Help me know. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Loving God, we have gathered on this Sunday morning to once again be in your presence to worship, to sing, to pray, and to be in the company of one another. May your spirit today, O oh God, just move through and among us. And let us just put aside any distractions, any burdens, any challenges that we've carried into this place. And for this next hour, God, can we just be open to the Spirit? Can we stop the chattering of our mind and just let the words come in, the words that we need to hear? And we say all this in your many names. Amen, amen, and amen. What a joy it is to welcome you today to Metropolitan Community Church of Albuquerque on this glorious Sunday morning. Um, everyone, please sign in on the attendance registers located in the seat pockets in front of you. If this is your first time here, please complete a welcome card, and if you bring that to me following worship, we will have a gift for you just to welcome you to this wonderful community of faith. To those watching on live stream or on our website, uh, thank you for joining us today, and we hope that you enjoy worship and that you will uh, include communion as you go through the service today, so get some crackers and juice or bread or whatever it is that you need uh, to take communion with us. Uh, just a couple quick announcements. If you can stay for just um, a few minutes after worship today to talk about Easter and some volunteers we're going to need to kind of make everything happen. We're going to do a potluck meal on Easter Sunday, so we'll need help with that and uh, some other things. Also, the, the fish fry dinner social at St. John's Methodist Church, they do it every Lent. We set a date for us going on Friday, March 24th. It's $14, and you get two pieces of fried or grilled fish, um, baked potato, french fries, coleslaw, fruit, green beans, macaroni and cheese. You get your pick of three of those for $14. And it's for a good cause. So you can meet us here at the church between 4.45 and 5, and, uh, or just meet us at St. John's at 5.15, and this information is in your bulletin here, so make sure you get one from Sue Can today. Take it home with you and put it on the ref refrigerator. Uh, so you don't forget, so we can gather together and do some social time together. But please do stay for the meeting today. Okay, let's take a deep breath. And the threshold moment is what we're moving into now. And that kind of just talks a little bit about our theme or gives us something to kind of focus on as we prepare to hear the word. Today we will hear the story of the woman at the well, also known as the Samaritan woman. It's a well-known and loved story of a woman who in the heat of the day meets Jesus there at the well and he asks her for a drink. Every time I read the story, I ask myself, when was the last time that I drew water for someone who was thirsty? Even more, when was the last time I drew water for myself to drink? So we are here today, and we are thirsty. Thirsty for hope. Thirsty for some good news. Thirsty for perhaps just a glimpse of God in this space. So let us have the courage today to wade into our story with open eyes and open hearts. May we have the courage to drink this moment in. May we take the time just to listen and to be still. And may we trust that even if we make it to the well and we discover we forgot our bucket, that God is still there to meet us. Amen and God bless you. to draw water at noon, as I so often had of late, I felt their hateful, snobbish stares, 
behind the closed shutters of their houses. It seemed that I could hear their whispered comments and snide remarks. The path was hot and dusty, burning my feet through the thin soles of my sandals. The sky was a colorless brass bowl, focusing heat upon my throbbing head beneath my flimsy veil. All I wanted was to fill my jar and hasten back to the dubious shelter of my hovel, except, of course, that I'd have to return to that snoring, sour-smelling creature, drunk far too early in the day. If I was lucky, he'd stay asleep while I prepared our meager noonday meal. If luckier still, he'd eat it without too much angry cursing that the meat was stringy and the bread had weevils. If I wasn't lucky. But at last, the house is far behind me. I came past the stone wall which shielded the well and almost dropped my jar. A man, a Jew, was seated in the shade of the tamarisk. And my heart leaped to my throat. I nearly turned and ran. Yet somehow, something in his manner made me stay. He spoke four simple words. Give me a drink. His voice was quiet, yet I felt as if he shouted. I felt as if the universe had paused, as if the heavens held their breath. I don't know where my answer came from or how I made my voice work at all, but I spoke the question of my heart. How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman, a Samaria? Yet even as I said these words, I knew my true question ran much deeper. How is it that you, a man of caste and privilege, can think to accept water from a woman such as I? His eyes gazed into mine, and I felt naked. I trembled to my deepest soul, sure his next words would flay me to the bone. And yet he merely said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The next instant, I was babbling. Stupidity poured from my mouth. I, who have prided myself on a skill with discourse, part of what has got me into trouble all my life, I'm sure, could only utter inanities. <laughs> I babbled on about how he had no bucket and how the well was deep. And was he greater than Jacob who gave us this well? Yet somehow, in all of this, I asked my true question. Where do you get that living water? Again, it seemed the universe was stilled. He spoke and the words burned in my heart. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them springs of water gushing up to eternal life. I cannot tell you the depths of my yearning in that moment. I thought of that long, hot, dusty road and, and those houses with their hateful, shuttered eyes. I thought of him who drank not water, but sour wine, fouling my home with his drunkenness. And I said, out of that agony of yearning, sir, give me this water, that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw my water. Again, his eyes pierced my soul. Go. Call your husband and come back. He knew, of course. I didn't have to say a word. But habits die hard, and words came rushing out of my foolish mouth before my mind could bridle it. I have no husband. And suddenly I knew that things must change. I found that myself struggling to deal with the reality. This was the moment. This was the time. 
Yet even so, as I've already said, old habits die hard. I tried to flounder back to old familiar ground, going on about the theological differences of the Jews and us. In one voice, I acknowledged him a prophet. In the next, I threatened, I challenged the primacy of worship in Jerusalem. Praise God. He didn't let it happen. Far from jumping into combat with trital doctrines I'd rejected long ago, he said a brand new thing. Woman, the hour is coming when you will worship Abba neither on the mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshiper will worship Abba in spirit and in truth. For Abba seeks such as these to worship. God is spirit, and those who worship must worship in spirit. From my innermost being, I answered him, I know that Messiah is coming who will proclaim all things to us. And as the trumpet call of heaven echoed in my soul, Jesus said to me, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Words cannot describe the tidal wave of joy which surged up in me then. He spoke of fountains gushing up, and it has been so all my life since. Sometimes it comes as cleansing tears, sometimes as joyous laughter. Always now, I seem to have the right words. Words to turn aside anger. Words to uplift and heal. Words to persuade and encourage. The neighbors who hated me before have now become good friends, as together we speak of Jesus and his love. The man who lay in my house, drinking his days away, abusing me in anger, has become a follower as well. Although all our hearts were broken when they crucified our Jews on a hill in that supposedly holy city of Jerusalem, they healed again a few days later when our risen Savior walked again amongst us. So now, it was not from the temple, but from a mountain such as we Samaritans worship on, that Jesus went back to his Abba. So now, we must go out, leaving our hills of home, following the path the Spirit shows us, carrying his living water to the desert hearts of other outcasts everywhere. Good pleasure, 
safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I constrain to be. Let thy grace now, like a feather, fall to wonder, Lord, on me. Under Lord, I feel it, ponderly the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it from thy courts above. Trudy, for doing your presentation of the Samaritan woman. She's one of my favorite characters in the Bible. This month, March, is Women's History Month, so it seems appropriate that we hear a little bit about the Samaritan woman. As most of you may know, back in the ancient world, in the time of Jesus, and even up until today, your place as a woman was defined by your connection to a man, be it your father, your brother, your husband, your son. Women needed the men to survive. They needed the men to shelter them from the heat and cold, to give them food and clothes, to protect them from harm. And the Samaritan woman, why did she have five husbands? My mother had like six, I think, so. <laughs> My sister and I were talking about that the other day. Well, in the time of Jesus, the men controlled marriage and divorce. So a man can just say he's divorcing his wife and she's out there gone on her own or if she was married to a brother who passed away and he had three other brothers and she would go to one of the brothers in the family that's just how they did things so she was kind of an outcast in her community in the ancient world going to get water from the well was a big social event and you went based on your status within the community so the most re respected and admired women or their servants would go to the well first. Samaritan woman, she's drawing her water alone and it's in the high heat of noon. And there she finds Jesus just waiting for her. And he says, will you give me something to drink? And back then, many Jewish people wouldn't speak to Samaritans because they were considered not fully Jewish. And also men and women didn't speak one another in the ancient world. But Jesus must have seen something in the Samaritan woman, maybe not only her great needs and her woundedness, I think he saw her perseverance, her giftedness, and her keen mind that had enabled her to survive all these years. They talk like rabbi to rabbi about theological issues. And Jesus and the unnamed woman, woman is one of the longest theological discussions in the four Gospels and one of the few times that Jesus reveals that he is the Messiah. So I want to take us back to the Israelites in the desert. How many people are familiar with that story? We, if you were raised in the church, the Israelites in the desert, they got free from Egypt. They were held in slavery. And so they're out in the desert, and they're walking, and Moses, um, I don't know how he stood it for 40 years with people that were <laughs> whining and complaining as much as they did. I mean, God did so many miracles for him. It's like, wow, you know. And uh, they're crying out, we don't have any water. We need something to drink. Give us water, Moses. But perhaps, maybe, what they were really asking was, God, have you abandoned us out here in the desert? Have you brought us out here and there's no water and we're going to die? 
But Moses, following the directions of God, brings forth water for the Israelites. Sometimes we want to say, God, where are you? Have you abandoned me in this time of need? But what if instead are we saying, where are you, God? Why aren't you here? What if we said something like, God, can you just show me something to remind me that I know you're here with me on this journey? Too often we want what we want, and we expect to get it right away. I always say, you know, I don't think God is a vending machine or a Santa Claus. Um, just one of my theological issues there. So. You know, Jesus learned to ask for, for what he needed. And I think he was telling us that none of us can rely truly on just ourselves. We need God, and we need each other. You know, what a risk for the Son of God, Jesus, to ask this woman for water. And then the woman boldly asks him, Jesus, for the living water he speaks of. Jesus, he sees in this woman that she can be the witness to the Samaritans and tell them, that he is a prophet and that he's come from God. She is one of the first witnesses of the Messiah, and she becomes a vessel of living water herself. Like the Israelites, like the Samaritan woman, when vulnerable, we cry out also, where are you, God? Are you here with us? And sometimes I think we're really asking deep down, God, do you really want me, and do you really love me? And that answer is always yes, always. It is yes to the Samaritan woman, and it's yes to us in our times of needs or wants. No matter what circumstances we may find ourselves in, no matter what we have done to survive, the answer is always yes, that God is with us on this journey, and that we are safe with God. God has a purpose and a plan for each one of us in changing our world, the world around us. We are each worthy to provide water, living water, to one another. And may we also know that we are loved by God unconditionally. Will you pray with me, please? Loving God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus and for his journey as he traveled the countryside ministering to others. I pray, O oh God, that you will feed us and sustain us this Sunday so that we can go out and continue our work in this world. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.
together in prayer as we lift the needs of our community and we place him at our Lord's feet. That he may comfort those who are in pain, ease the mind of others that have their mental issues and bring them to peace of mind. As we lift those in our families that are sick, who have received a serious diagnosis of health, we lift those in our own church as they deal with their health issues. We pray that our Lord watches over those who are, are traveling, that he may hold them in his arms and keep them from harm. Heavenly Father, we lift our pastor, that you may guide her as you see it, Lord. As we rise every morning, we ask and we pray that you help us walk through the day. We ask the same today, that you lift us, that you keep us strong, that you help us to be tolerant of others, and that you fill this world with peace, Lord. We ask all these good things through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, church. Um, let's pray for the offerings. Um, dear Lord, um, today as we gather and collect offerings today, please bless these so that those um, we can keep our church open for seekers that can come here and seek their way to you. In Jesus' name, amen. There's several ways you can do offerings as well. Um, you could follow the prompts by PayPal on our website and the good old mail service. Um, peace be with you. Have a blessed day.
was saying, be careful what you pray for. Knowing the time change and that it would be difficult for some people to get here or remember to change the time. I did ask our Lord to help me through the day to help fulfill the needs of our church and to be present, to be present. And as we come to the sharing of our Lord's meal, we're reminded this, this is the time of the year that was the hardest on Jesus. Because Jesus knew from the time he was born what his path was going to be. And as the day came, the night before he was to fulfill his path, he shared a meal with his disciples, with family and friends. And after the meal, he took a piece of bread, thanking God and blessing it in his name, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He took that piece of bread and he broke it and he shared it with each and every person in that room. And he said, take and eat from this bread, for it is my body broken for you. He also took a cup in the same manner, giving thanks and praise to God. He blessed it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he shared it with each and every person in that room. And he said, take and drink from this cup, for it is the fruit of the vine and the new and everlasting covenant. Whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, remember me. For I am always with you. Here at MCC, we practice an open table. It is open to anyone that chooses to come with an open heart and to receive of this meal. If you have already received your meal at your chairs and you wish a prayer, please come forward. And Pastor and I will be happy to share a prayer with you, pray with you and for you. So we will hold her and the servers, please come forward. <laughs> 